Hi, this short video focuses on the February 15th, 2021 EF3 tornado that occurred close to Wilmington, North Carolina during the late evening hours. It's a case like many I've seen in the past in which the radar alone may not support much of any warning lead time or in which pre-storm environment could lead the warning forecaster in the wrong direction. So the question we'll answer here is, could accurate real-time mesoscale environment analysis or MIA support better targeted threat messaging down to the county or sub-county level during and prior to any potential warning period. If you have any doubt about the value of MIA in severe weather operations, I hope this example demonstrates that value. I don't know if every forecaster gets tested with a big event or not. I suspect a majority do at some point in their career. My test came on an August day in 1993 when I was an intern in Richmond, Virginia. Back then, we didn't have Doppler radar. I faced a tornado outbreak that day, including an F4 that struck Petersburg, Virginia, killing three and injuring nearly 200, causing over $40 million in damage. The radar we had back then showed nothing but a band of low top showers, only up to about 25,000 feet with no lightning reported. And this was in August. We just had a moderate shower that contained a big tornado as it crossed over Petersburg. What saved my career that day was a new Skywarn spotter network I had set up the prior year. It turned out to be time and effort well spent. For our case here, our focus is not on spotter support, but rather on near storm environment support when it comes to proactively predicting what's about to occur. On more than one occasion in my career, I've had to console a forecaster who missed a major hazard occurrence that resulted in loss of life or many injuries. That was due, at least in part, to loss of environment situational awareness. Seeing the end result and hearing the media question why no warning was issued, it can be very depressing to go through. And it was not hard for this to happen in the February 15th case, as the environment changed rapidly from not supporting a tornado to supporting a strong tornado over just a two hour period. And the changes were not caught by some of the mesoanalysis tools. The MIA training course was designed and shared because in future big events, I want forecasters to experience the great satisfaction of hitting these type of events with 20 or 30 minute lead times, as well as messaging the potential before the storm even gets going. It can be challenging at times, especially as you'll see in this case when the SPC mesoanalysis page provides inaccurate environment information. With science, you cannot skip steps or eventually it will end badly. That means you can't just trust SPC mesoanalysis output. You have to QC the data to ensure they're accurate. Look at actual observational data. And you have to look at soundings and photographs rather than just specific values of Cape or helicity. The EF3 tornado began just inland over far southern Brunswick County, North Carolina, west of Sunset Beach, and tracked quickly northeast, likely at 40 to 50 miles per hour. Here you can see some of the damage photos from this event that were posted on WFO Wilmington's website. There was a slight risk of severe storms for the coastal counties of North Carolina, but no watch or warning was in effect prior to the tornado. Prior rounds of elevated convection went through the area with no severe weather reported. So just over five minutes before the tornado formed, radar wasn't showing much at 0.5 degrees, although it's interesting to note possible beam blockage, perhaps enhanced by a super refracted beam given a strong shallow frontal inversion at the radar site that may have affected what the radar showed, at least for the eastern half of the storm of interest. If you go to a higher scan, up at 8,000 feet, the radar showed a B word forming with a rotational velocity of 45 knots associated with a strong, deep, mid-level mesocyclone. That's a bit scary. Low-level rotation didn't tighten until after 11.30 p.m. with tornado debris detected on the CCC product around 11.37. So radar didn't necessarily show an imminent tornado threat until the tornado formed. However, did it show substantial potential well in advance of the tornado? 20 minutes earlier, when the storm was over water, radar data showed a B-wear structure and 40 to 45 knots of elevated rotation as part of a deep mesocyclone. This likely led the prob severe tool to show a nearly 90% tornado probability at this time. The storm was in the warm sector over water with a favorable combination of moderate instability and strong low and mid-level shear. The question is what type of environment would the storm experience as it moved northeastward inland? 
at this time, it was a cool and foggy environment across eastern North Carolina. The far eastern North Carolina 0Z sounding, about five hours ahead of the event, showed a deep, intense frontal inversion with surface temperatures only in the 40s. However, further south, the 0Z Charleston, South Carolina sounding showed a much more shallow, though still intense, inversion with temperatures in the mid-50s. The 0Z surface map showed much warmer conditions and a more southeasterly wind component offshore. So somewhere in between was a warm front that was lifting northward or northwestward ahead of an intense upper trough. Here are the surface observations for Wilmington, North Carolina, about a county to the north of the event, showing conditions reflecting the approaching front with surface winds becoming southeasterly and temperatures and dew points rising into the upper 50s and into the low 60s after 11 p.m. in the evening. Note the observations ahead of the supercell when it finally got to Wilmington, the temperature dew point of 69 or 67. That's pretty impressive. I don't know exactly why it was that warm, maybe mixed down from what was the top of the low level inversion. I'm, I'm not sure but a pretty impressive warming for late in the evening. At an observation site closer to the tornado event, temperatures and dew points were about 64 degrees or 18 Celsius just before tornado occurrence with a seven knot southerly wind. If you modify the Charleston sounding with 18 degree Celsius surface temperatures and dew points, nearly all the frontal inversion is erased. You also lower the inflow layer down to near the surface, thus taking advantage of much more low level shear Note the large cyclonically curved photograph and the 0 to 3 kilometer SRH value well above 600. Another illustration of the rapid environment change can be seen near the radar site, close to where the tornado passed by. This image shows near surface base velocity data at the radar site. Note the change from an easterly wind at 2Z, well north of the warm front, to southeasterly at 3Z and south southeasterly at 4Z indicating the approach of the warm front, likely leading the frontal inversion to become very shallow. At both the Wilmington and Cape Fear observation sites, conditions at 3Z were what you might expect north of the warm front, foggy with low ceilings and cool surface conditions, with an east to east southeast wind. In just 90 minutes, conditions changed, with the warm front moving inland from the Cape Fear site, with temperatures and dew points rising more than 10 degrees, despite it being late in the evening. As I showed in the prior slide, an 18 degrees Celsius surface temperature and dew point yields not much of an inversion. The SBC mesoanalysis page was slow to catch up to what was occurring. At 4Z, prior to tornado occurrence, the data showed no surface base cape and a weak amount of mixed layer cape along with some sin. This is based on surface temperatures and dew points in the upper 50s to around 60, not in the mid 60s. It showed large zero to three kilometer SRH values above 500, mostly inland with lower values further offshore, and also showed enough SRH above the inversion inland, 150 to 200 as shown on the effective layer SRH plot to support elevated supercells. The significant tornado parameter showed nothing inland or near the coast. So the problem here is that the SPC page apparently did not have the temporal or spatial resolution to pick up the small scale environment changes taking place. Interestingly, the 4Z HER run did show greater ML cape across much of Brunswick County by 5Z, the light blue shade representing 1,000 joules per kilogram or greater. How consistent was the HER in showing this? It was not terribly consistent in terms of magnitude, but here is the uh, five-hour forecast from the 0Z HER still showing uh, 1,000 joules per kilogram of ML cape over Brunswick County, North Carolina. So the herd run was fairly consistent in suggesting the warm front would move inland over the southeastern tip of North Carolina. Dynamic support was quite good in maintaining convection through the evening. We have a strong upper trough rotating through the region with a 50 to 60 knot low level jet right over the area of concern. We have a new surface load developing beneath divergent upper flow with a warm front extending northeastward to just off the North Carolina coast. The SBC mesoanalysis page indicated good low-level moisture convergence along the warm front beneath decent upper-level divergence, leading to a big blue area on the 850 to 200 millibar differential divergence image, suggesting deep lift that may have supported sounding modification above the surface. 
This is a really dangerous setup. It's nighttime, so you have little spotter support. The environment is rapidly changing, and rather than having a cold front through, move through with more linear convection, you have a warm front that could support discrete supercells or supercell clusters. Both cold and warm sectors show back to low level flow, meaning large SRH across a wide area. As a mesoanalyst, in the rare times when this type of pattern sets up, you yell danger, danger, and encourage the IDSS person to do the same for our partners, especially media partners. So to get a 20 to 30 minute lead time on this hazard, the decision is needed at this point in time with a supercell still offshore. That's not easy to do when you have a storm that at least according to the SPC mesoanalysis page, could move into a less favorable environment inland that really supports elevated storms. Temptation is to wait another scan or two and see what the radar shows, right? This is where the mesoanalyst's role is important in helping the warning team proactively anticipate what will evolve, at least from a probabilistic angle. The MIA course included some modules on interpreting and communicating probabilities. Consider this probability display based on environment favorability for tornado, also including radar-based storm structure, and then the end result on the uh, x-axis. And then as you see here, we have an area within this display where we would issue a warning versus areas where we would not issue a warning. How you set up this display in your mind depends on how you manage risk. This might be an average setup. For a storm going over a big city, you'd likely expand this warning decision area downward and perhaps to the left. For a storm over a swamp or desert where there's no people, you might shrink it upward and to the right. For decisions based solely on fear that something bad could happen, not based on science, you would probably expand it greatly downward and to the left. Anyway, how might you mentally construct a probability distribution here for a potential tornado, the probability for any of these potential uh, tornado or tornado-like conditions on the x-axis? Well, when you have an unfavorable environment for a tornado, or a favorable environment but no storms at all, you begin with a curve like this, with a very high probability of nothing dropping quickly to zero. Now let's say you have a supercell with rotation, but in an unfavorable environment with a strong low-level inversion, such that you might get an elevated vortex above the inversion, maybe a funnel cloud. So your probability distribution might look more like this. Now let's say the storm moves into an environment with a weaker, more shallow inversion near the surface. The probability for no tornado may still be greater than that for a tornado, but mentally you might have a probability value for a tornado that starts to increase though perhaps still below your warning criteria. If the environment changes such that there is a minimal inversion, allowing the inflow layer to get near the ground, maximizing available streamwise vorticity, your mental probability curve might become this. Now we have the tornado probability into the warning zone, right? Finally, in this more favorable environment, you have a big supercell with a strong deep mesocyclone that could greatly enhance inflow into the storm increasing the inflow region of your hodograph shape and supporting SRH values of 800 or 900 plus. Now mentally, not only do you have a relatively high probability of tornado, but you're talking about an environment that could favor a strong tornado, and that probability could rise into your warning zone. Each of these probability curves means a different action to be taken. Here, there would be no action to be taken. With this curve, you might issue a statement for a possible funnel cloud. Here you might issue a severe thunderstorm warning with a tornado tag to indicate tornado possible, but not necessarily imminent. At this point, with the probability of tornado in your warning area there mentally, you go with a tornado warning. And then by this time, point in time, you probably would be calling the emergency manager with a heads up that something big might be coming. The radar alone may not get the warning person from here to here. It may be the mesoanalyst who provides the information to get the warning team to the right spot mentally in terms of what is expected to occur. So this is a case where you could not wait until the storm moved inland to confirm your suspicion by seeing low level rotation spin up. Longer lead time information requires earlier action. So this is the time for targeted threat messaging. 
either through a warning issuance or IDSS targeted messaging. We have an established supercell with a strong deep mesocyclone tracking towards Brunswick County, North Carolina, where we are seeing signs of warm front movement or reformation there. Plenty of signs that any frontal inversion is weakening and becoming quite shallow, supporting an extension of the inflow layer down to near the surface. Here's an example where we can target the message down to the sub-county level and have partners ready in case the feared worst ends up occurring. Considering the time of night you're dealing with, and given the fact that the Zero Z Her and possibly other tools suggested that the warm front likely may move inland over Brunswick County, you likely want to message potential to partners and the public earlier in the evening before people go to bed, given the pattern that could set up and the result it could lead to. The mesoanalyst has an important role here in recognizing rapid environment change that could lead to a different end result. This can involve considerable effort from a well-trained individual, thus the MIA training course is important. It involves developing good mental assessments of probability and understanding uncertainty and having the ability to communicate this to the team. One can easily be misled when not looking at accurate data and not QCing the data you're looking at. You cannot skip steps in science to get a good result. The mesoanalyst also plays a role in helping the warning and IDSS staff proactively downscale the threat message to the county or sub-county level. So given this case as shown, which of the NWS chat messages below would be best to send to media and EM partners, say 30 minutes ahead of the storm's arrival? I'll pause for just a moment. So this was a rare, dangerous, cool season setup that was coming together in far southeastern North Carolina with a warm front moving inland and a supercell approaching from the south. With the environment expected to become favorable for tornadoes with storms that track near the warm front, I would suggest that the third message below is the best one. It is the one that we start spinning up more specific information, not only on the what, but the where and the when. How about these examples for a Twitter message uh, ahead of the storm for the public? At 20 to 30 minutes ahead of the storm, which of these do you think would be best to send out? The leftmost example shows the SBC day one outlook with the slight risk along the coastal counties, marginal risk further inland. This is more appropriate well ahead of the event. Where we're just talking about isolated severe storms, uh, possibly near the coast. It's not the best message as the event gets going. How about the middle image? This may be reasonable for a lesser severe threat, mainly if we're talking about elevated storms in a less favorable tornado environment. However, it still does not provide detail exactly on the what, where, and the when. The rightmost example shows that detail with the tornado potential within the yellow area during the next 30 minute period. This is targeted threat messaging covering a sub-county area, and that is what Mia is focused on. So some concluding thoughts. Warnings, even with minimal lead time, meet our mission. Mia is where we utilize science to excel beyond the mission minimum. It allows us to be proactive rather than simply reacting to radar signatures. And that can mean more lead time to ensure our partners are ready ahead of an event. It may involve understanding potential from a probabilistic angle, understanding the level of uncertainty to make the best decisions possible, providing critical information well before the radar shows the hazard. MIA allows us to provide targeted threat messaging beyond the normal warning period, once we understand and have credible, specific threat information to provide the what, the where, and the when. So in this case example, radar alone really supported minimal lead time threat information. MIA supported multi-hour evolution information and more targeted warning level information before the hazard was evident on radar. So this is why MIA is important in operations, to anticipate how this would evolve as the warm front moves inland and the supercell approaches from the south and tracks over or near the warm front in an environment rapidly becoming favorable for tornado genesis. Using radar alone can support small or no lead time. It is MIA in, along with radar that supports longer lead time warning information and well as multi-hour lead time evolution information. Being able to provide sufficient lead time 
in this case, means having to decide what to do before the storm even moves on shore. And that's pretty challenging. Accurately interpreting rapid environment change can be a continuous effort at times, especially given the fact that the data you have may not be accurate, requiring you to QC the data with observation data available. This is an example where MIA, not simply radar, is key to creating the mental probabilistic picture supporting threat messaging with lead time. That can make the difference between a depressing result for the warning team and one that brings real job satisfaction. Thank you for watching.